David Viscott, and welcome. This is the program where you tune in and find yourself being talked about. Sometimes you find the issue that's th been bothering you all week, sometimes all life, being talked about right in front of you, and it strikes you. And that's what it's about, to have you understand a little more clearly that your problem is not one that you have alone, that you're not alone in the world, and that, you know, things can work out. And I hope that you see other people solving and addressing problems gives you the courage to take a look at your own life a little more and, well, maybe take a risk to make things better. Dottie, I see you've returned. Yes. Uh, so it couldn't have been that horrible last week. Well, I wasn't sure that I was going to like it, but actually I, I really liked it and I felt even more involved in the show than I did w when I was just the producer in the back. Well, they should know that for, for a year and a half, after a show that I'm always calling you and saying, how was it? On Monday, you're calling me up and saying, was I okay? Exactly. Now, uh, one thing that we didn't talk about last week, when it was our first week back, was that we had so much mail while we were on hiatus from people, and a lot of the reactions were people felt really abandoned, and it seemed like it was the kind of reaction that a person would have in therapy if their therapist went on vacation. Do you think that it's like that for people who watch well, all the time? Don't use the word therapist. I think it's more the kind of reaction you have when someone you count on for some support. Um, when I talk to people about how they see what we do here, they get the feeling that this is a voice of sanity. It's a moment where someone's going to hear the truth. And when a week that you're going through feels crazy or you're overworked and, and things don't seem to make much sense or the kids are are uh, eating the wallpaper and the, no matter what you tell them they're, they're not they're not getting any better just seeing that it's possible to work through a problem can be something that holds you together and um, uh, believing believing that someone can be helped is often the only help you need to believe that you can work it out we got probably about 25 letters this week from people saying how happy they were that you're back. So well, I think that is really great. I should send myself a letter because I'm happy I'm back too. Yeah, Who? it's great. What do you have, Dottie? We have on line two, we have Vicki who's um, getting some unusual vibes from her girlfriend. Vic Vicki? What did I do? Did I just cut her off? Vicki? I think maybe you cut her off. So. Earlier, you were talking about this rapture, which I don't understand anything about. Jim is on line 14. Why don't you talk to him, and we'll try to get Vicki back while okay. you're talking. Jim. Jim, are you there? Am I doing something wrong? Well, why don't you talk about the rapture to the camera and the audience for a little while, and let me go in the back and see what's going on. I don't know a lot about the rapture, but I know... Well, talk about something you know a lot well, about. Well, people are... Um, people, why don't you go in the back and see what's wrong, Dottie? I'm going to do that. I love it when people have more than one job description. Huh? You know, people, there's talk about the rapture, which is that time when uh, the end of the world is coming. And um, without getting into the theological aspects of that sort of thing, the time when all of the ills of the world will be added up. You know, if you look at, at life today on this planet at any given moment, it'll always seem as if the uh, predictions of Revelation in, in the New Testament are about to come true, you know. The scent it doesn't hold, uh, there's lying, um, corruption abounds, people are unhappy, and what we are struck with is a sense that uh, life is um, losing control. Things are going out of control and going out of control at a greater uh, speed. And while that seems to be true, and if you ever try to make it on the um, 405 on a Friday afternoon in any direction, you begin to wonder what, what you're doing and what's happened to society and where can you go to escape it. But there is this feeling of being consumed by the very civilization we've created. Look at it. I mean, pestilence, AIDS, um, financial insecurity, uh, an election that doesn't seem to offer a clear choice and, and one does not really have a sense of um, a clear purpose. The government does not seem to have a handle on its problems and our educational system seems to be slipping. How do you educate kids with 40 in a class? So in, in a time like that, like this, it always feels as if things are going to fall apart. It felt like that many other times in history, in, often before large wars. But history is nothing more than the story of economic and uh, governmental systems trying to find a kind of balance. 
And before the present disruption in the world caused by the Soviet Union uh, and all the other things comes to a grip, we're going to go through rough times. But, you know, you have to control your own life. And to be too concerned about whether the planet's going to evolve or not, well, that may not be what your life's about. Dottie, have you found out anything? Found our working try, line 14, Jim. I think he's there. Okay, let's see what scoops you. Jim. Oh. Are you there, Jim? Why is this not happening? What do you say, Dottie? Do we have a problem that you can solve? Uh, it, you know, our phones are working back here, and they're not working out there, so if worse comes to worse, and you know what? Go to commercial, and then if, we'll bring you in here if we have to, and you can talk on the phone in the booth. I like that. So there it is. This is what live television is about, huh, folks? Great. We'll be right back. What do you do when everything goes wrong in your life and there's no way, no expectation of what you can do to solve it? When you start off the day with the best intentions and the right attitude, and then you come to your workplace and all of a sudden everything that can go wrong goes wrong, what do you do then? Do you lose it? Do you let the stress overwhelm you? Do you let your blood pressure climb? Do you blame your equipment? Do you start screaming and yelling at people? Well, you're watching me right now as nothing here is working. My telephone bank, well, it's a joke. We press a button and nothing comes through. What am I going to do? Am I going to go crazy? Am I going to be nuts? No. I'm going to tell you what I'm feeling and how I go through it and how I deal with it because maybe in this real life situation, it's an opportunity for you to see how I deal with it. You can turn around and yell at me if you want to. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking. As you know, I completely forgot you were there. No, but, you know, what you have to do in a situation like this is every crisis is an opportunity. Right. Well, one opportunity that we might have here is it seems that the phones in my booth are working, and um, if it works for the director, we could move you into my booth, and I could just work out of the back. Benny, can you talk over this? Can we hear your voice on the air? Sure, yeah. Hi, Benny. Hi, Benny. Hi. So, so what would it be like if David moved in here and he took the calls in this booth? I think that's very possible. Uh, why don't we go to a break, and then we'll move them, and then we'll come back and call them about Okay, if we go to a break now, this is really going to test the loyalty of our viewers, well, and you know, I hope uh, they will do that. Be loyal. Loyalty, schmoyalty. You know what this is? is the show will now become very open, and now we can take all the risks that we worried about taking, and we can do all these crazy things. I can move in the back with the screeners, and we can talk and check things out and do the whole thing live on the air. Who knows? Maybe we're going to have breakthrough television. Well, it's a good thing you're not wearing tennis shorts tonight, then. I mean, both of us are wearing, you know, sometimes you could just be dressed from the waist up in this business, but we both are fully clad. Well, I think that's okay. Okay, uh, so why don't you, you go do to have, commercial? Do you, do you have headphones in there? I, have, I don't have headphones in here. So I'll need a set of headphones in there. Well, okay. All hey. right, let's go to, let you go to say something nice and go to commercial, and we'll try to fix it in two minutes. Okay. The point is, the world is always a little bit crazy, and the fact that you think you have it organized, the fact that you think you have a plan, is just kidding yourself. You know, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plan. If you want to make something work, you have to be flexible and realize that uh, nothing means that much in a hundred years and that your real strength is in dealing with your weaknesses and being flexible in the face of uncertainty. It's like driving a car. You don't know how the traffic is going to go. You need a little space between you and the possible collision. Stay tuned. We're going to take a little space here. We'll be right back. We're going to make a show out of this. Trust me. Welcome back to the search for modern communication. Solving the problem? Okay, here's what's going to happen, and I, that and I want to tell you so, That tone of voice says, no, we haven't. So. 
God, well, we solved it somewhat. Okay. When people call in, we're asking them for their phone numbers because our, our regular phones work in the back. They just aren't working for you. So if people give us their phone numbers and we call them back on another phone, this is a little technical, and then it's broadcast into the studio. So you don't have to use... So I'll hear it here, but I have, to hear, I have to hear this so I can hear Benny. Right, so you can hear the director. That's our director. And, um, so Jim who we were going to talk to earlier I, is I, there for us. Don't be flustered, sweetheart. This is going to work. No, I'm, 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 if I get to hear one caller's voice, I'm going to be really happy, though. Okay, so all I have to say, Jim, are you there? Watch this magic. Yes, hello. How are you? Thank goodness. Jim, how are you? <laughs> Pretty good. How old are you? I'm 25. And what can I do for you? Well, first of all, I, I understand the perils of uh, live, and uh, it, it's worth it, David. Just just be aware of that. <laughs> okay. Um, the thing that I'm worried about is that uh, lately I've been hearing a lot about uh, the end of the world and all this. It started right here on the show tonight. Yes. <laughs> um, I've been hearing this from a couple of friends who are, are in really good places that they... What are they saying? Well... They're giving their analogies for one to start with. Now, this was a few months ago that I began hearing about this, and I, I gave it some thought and consideration. It's not something I think on a daily basis. What was the first feeling you had when you when you heard it? It was absolutely interesting. Absolutely interesting. Yes, that, that interesting choice of words. Go that ahead. They had uh, this this well interesting in the sense that they had this whole idea of how things were going to work out, including, for example, what the beast is. Oh, go ahead, tell us. <laughs> well, I'll. Okay. Do uh, you want me to just jump right into that, or sure? Just tell us. But what, let's let's hear the the news. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things is that uh, the beast is actually the World Bank, which has not quite been named yet, either the World Bank or the Green Bank or something. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, it's really interesting. After talking with him and and uh, and. Uh, uh, looking into uh, revelations and everything, it says things like, uh, I believe, something like ten horns and seven heads or something. And that fits with the number of countries and the number of people that got this thing started. Another interesting thing is, you know how it says that... This, no thing, being, this, this thing being what? what you uh, the World Bank. Okay, but what thing being started? Uh, the World Bank. Okay. Uh, as in the, the trinity of, of the financial powers or such. That, that got the bank started in the first place. Now, the most interesting part of it was that, you know how in the Revelations it says that the, make no mistake, the number of the beast is 666? Yes. Well, it just happened to, it happens to be that the uh, international world, what is it, the sequential banking number for the World Bank is 666. That's quite interesting. And he gave me a scenario about how possibly uh, the world would go to a complete world currency. Uh, and um, since there would be a world currency, it would, it would solve a lot of problems in the sense of stabilizing certain countries' monetary values and things like this. Uh, and then, why, are you calling, why are you calling this the rapture? Why aren't you calling it the upcoming financial world crisis? Well, because that's the part of it. I mean, looking into revelations and such, I'm, I'm not so worried about the, the fact of the bank or the, or the beast or anything. It's the whole concept of the of the rapture and of the judgment of the seven years and everything uh i i mean even yesterday on cnn world report there's uh, uh a korean preacher and um there always of, of, there always is yeah yeah I, I know how the end of the century tends to trigger these type of things well we always approach these things with the expectation of some cataclysm occurring mm -hmm. And uh, when you approach a thousand years, you know, right. people have those kinds of feelings. Whether or not the, the, year's, the year 2000 or the year 2001 doesn't make any difference. It's what people expect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're jittery and you are expecting something bad to happen, something bad happens. Mm -hmm. It happens, first of all, inside you, so it doesn't even make a difference whether it's happening around you. Right. But if a lot of people are expecting the same horrible thing to happen, a lot of people get jittery at the wheel a lot of the times, and things seem, people seem to lose it. Why do people hold together? People hold together because they believe that there's a cohesiveness and mm -hmm. that there's a unity in society and the ground of life, the ground of life, the force behind life. And there are no world leaders, really, are there? I don't know what happened, but there don't seem to be any, any people who are, who are 
who are preaching the real gospel of love, which is, you know, you will get through this. Right. Believe in yourself. Right. Do your daily job with enthusiasm, affection, and efficiency. And if everyone else does that, we'll all get through this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, it's not just keep a good thought. It's do something positive today. Mm -hmm. Make it better for someone else in one simple way. You hear someone uh, screaming at the, the kid in the mailroom, and you realize that they're taking it out on him. Instead of walking by, you just say, Hey, Maxie, leave the kid alone. Why are you taking right. it out on him? In other words, to insinuate your goodness in the world a little more by giving people a little extra room and traffic to move, by not honking the horn when someone doesn't go at the green light right in front of you, by realizing that you need to put patience into the world. No matter how compressed this world is, uh, we can make it a lot looser and a lot more comfortable by just giving in a little bit and understanding that other people in the other car could be our family and I apply that to every place. I, I, I believe that that's true. I, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm naturally in, in usually a happy state and, and uh, I feel that I'm still that way. It's just now it seems to be on a daily basis that I, I start thinking about this. Well, I, now you're starting to see all of, the, all of the confusion. This is a very confusing time in American politics mm -hmm. with these three candidates. I mean, who do you vote for? I mean, we certainly have to have a change, mm -hmm. uh, and but you know, gosh, Clinton seems to be lying, and Perot's got a good plan, but he's a quitter. Who do we vote for? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that what everyone's feeling in their heart? Whether you're a Republican and you're going to stay with the party, mm -hmm. or whether you really believe in change and you're going to go for Clinton, or whether you, you know, don't we all have serious doubts about all these people? Is this the best again? Mm -hmm. and so I think. We can only speak to what's happening in this country. You know, there are always people who will sell off all their furniture and housing right. before. Don't do that. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't plan to. No. You can. Uh, you, what What I suggest to you, Jim, is that you look at the feelings of rapture, mm -hmm. and see yourself as someone who is almost sucked into it, mm -hmm. and let it happen around you. But be the center of a world that's gone sane instead of crazy. If you are ever confused about what to do in the world. Do something ordinary and sane. Shave, take a shower, clean up some, clean up some shelves. Do what you have to do. Uh, and uh, what I like to do is I like to go out and prune trees. Do something natural, do something ordinary, and life will start coming back. Dottie, who do we have now? We have Bonnie, who's 31 years old. She's extremely frustrated. Okay, do, do I have to do anything, or are you going to send the call right to me? Okay, thanks. Hang on, okay? Okay, Bonnie. Yeah? Hi, Bonnie. Hello. How old are you, Bonnie? 31. 31. Okay. Do we sound too terribly misjointed tonight? No, not too bad. Okay. What's going on with you? You sound like you're troubled. Yeah, um, I just don't feel much of a or a woman anymore. Why? Um, well, I've never really been able to enjoy sex. How come? I don't know. I mean, I, I've heard what it's supposed to be like, and it's never been that way for me. Are you single or married? Single. Have you ever had a long-term relationship with anyone? Yes. And what did, was that like? Okay, but it seems like I'd get... No, I'm talking about the relationship, not the sex. How was the relationship? Mm, well, it was strained most of the time. So how could you expect sex to be good in a strained relationship? When you say a relationship is strained, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, we didn't see eye to eye on, you know, things that I thought was important. Well, such as what? Well, religion or, um, you know, our attitude toward life. And how did your attitudes differ? I was always like, despite the terrible things that would happen, I tried to find something that could be gained out of... So he was pessimistic and a downer, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. So who wants to have sex with a person like that? Well, at times he could be very kind and gentle and understanding and, and loving. When, and when he was, did you trust him? Yeah. Or did you still have feelings of disquiet over the parts of your relationship that you disagreed about? Oh, there were times when that just seemed to fade away. And at those times, was sex better? 
Yeah, but it just never seemed like I'd get the complete enjoyment out of it that I should. You mean climax? Yeah. Have you ever climaxed? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, well, you'd know if you had. Um, it doesn't sound, it sounds to me like you're the sort of person who needs to feel very protected before you can be that vulnerable. And when you have a lot of questions about the other person, it sounds to me like you naturally hold back. Why are we making this into a problem? Um, well, there's something else that what? happened. Years ago? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, um... I had only had sex twice, and then I was raped. When was that? Um, almost eight years ago. So that would be when you were just about getting involved with other people, right? Well, yeah, I'd only had sex twice with a boyfriend that I thought I was going to marry. And was... And it was his first time. So. Uh-huh. So that, you know, all right. So what did you do about the rape? Did you see anyone? Did you talk about those feelings? advocacy on sexual assault. There was a, a counselor there that helped me through. Well, it doesn't sound like you're through it. Well, no. Um, well, it, that we're there, okay? But yeah, the, I mean, I think I worked through some of it, the, but... But whatever hasn't been worked through is standing between you and a relationship that you can be at your, your most comfortable self and it also probably has to do with why you're not choosing a relationship that's best for you before you do anything else you've got to clean up the emotions of the past or else they'll just end up replaying and at some point your guard is up and one of the things that is, re that is required uh, you know to develop a sense of orgasm a sense of self is uh, the ability to lower your guard and you haven't got that because you're still you're still being protective. And what I would do right now is I would, I would get involved in a, um, a continuation, either with the same person or with someone new, to help you go through the feelings and see which ones which uh, have not been dealt with and which feelings I suspect they have to do with trust, uh, most likely anger and hurt, and also shame and uh, the guilt over uh, not having been uh, more... Uh, protective and those kinds of feelings but what I think you need to do is you need to resolve the unresolved part okay that's where you have to go now we'll be right back you stay tuned I think we've got this problem licked which means the show's a normal show again if this can ever be normal Welcome back. Dottie, how are we doing? Do we have, are we in real, or are we still doing this jerried up thing? We're still doing this jerried up thing, but we have the, the most amazing technical people here who can jerry this up at a moment's notice. I think it's just incredible. It's true. If they only made house calls. <laughs> um, we have, I don't have to tell you any line numbers because we have no lines, but we do have Michelle uh, floating out here in the studio someplace who is, um, wants to talk to you about some problems she's having with her children. Michelle. Yes. Magic to hear you sound like this. <laughs> How old are you, Michelle? 26. Why are you calling? Well, I have been having a lot of problems um, lately dealing with my children. I have four kids and I'm finding myself resenting them to the point of hate. Hate? Hate. <laughs> um, I, I, all my children, I chose to have them. I wanted them very desperately. I love kids, and ever since I was little, I was not, you know, very career-oriented. I wanted to be a wife and a mom, and, you know, that was always my thing. But, but, the, but you didn't always feel hatred of them, did you? No, no, no. It's just been actually within the past couple of years. Um, I, you know, I, I have, my, you know, my children are pretty close together. I have an eight-year-old, a four-year-old, and two two-year-olds. And... Uh, Twins? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that especially the twins have been so overwhelming. Um, 
I, I, I have absolutely no life of my own. Um, I, my whole life is centered around kids and doing for them, and it's not just one of those things at 7 o'clock in the morning till, you know, they go to bed. It seems like it's a 24-hour thing because there's always one of the four kids that get up in the middle of the night, and somebody always wants something. Um, somebody's always destroying something or breaking something. Well, or I understand that. Well, the concern is, how did this go to the word hate? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how, I, I just have this rage inside me. I when did that, when did that start? Um, I would say probably when the twins were, got around three months old. Three months old, when they started moving around. Yeah, but I also was kind of dumb and I started school that, that time and I was taking 19 units and a very heavy, heavy course Wait, load. wait, wait, and Nine. 19 units with three months old twins? Yeah, and one of them was in intensive care at the time. He had been put back into an intensive care for okay. the problems he was having. What are you doing? <laughs> what, what, what was that all about? Well, when I was pregnant with the twins, they were a planned pregnancy. Um, when we found out that I was pregnant with twins, my husband flipped out. He, ba he just literally flipped out because... What, did, what do you mean flipped out? Um... He all of a sudden decided that he didn't want to have to do anything for me. He didn't think that I should have to stay off my feet. Okay, so I you... I started you, with problems from the time I was eight weeks pregnant, and did you it have was a, a total inconvenience to him. Did you have e eclampsia? They're not quite sure what I had. I'd had a twin um, six years before that were, that were tw 21 weeks. They okay. were born at 21 weeks. And so. why did your husband pull away? Have you ever talked to him about that? Yeah, he told me, um, you know, I, I asked him one time, and he said he was being honest, and it was just something that really hurt me a lot to hear him say it, but he said he hated me for having twins because he felt like me having the kids was taken away from his youth and his um, freedoms, and, you know, financially they were a tremendous burden. Their medical bills over $150,000. Well, we, we, we thank him for being candid, <laughs> but has he changed at all now? Um, he goes back and forth. It's really weird. Sometimes he's, he's very um, So you're not, angry at the, you're not angry at the kids at all? Uh, well, <laughs> in, no. Right. You're <laughs> angry at him. Of course. Okay. But see, it goes even deeper than that with him. He's he's a very violent person at times. Very violent. He's pulled you know he's pulled a gun on me before. He's pulled a gun on you. Yeah. Uh, he he's in law enforcement. He's a what? He's in law enforcement, and he you know that how law enforcement people are. That's kind of like an extension of their body, and they don't see it as being something that you know. They may get angry, and they don't see it as anything that's gonna hurt you. But it's like you know, same thing as if I were to pick up a book or something like that. You know. It's, all right. So, so your husband is is in is he in the LAPD? No. But he's in law enforcement. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing is he's out of control. Yeah. Okay. He can't. He can get out of control. We got into a fight a week ago, and he, it was a stupid thing. It was over the oldest son over a pair of glasses of all things. Because well, it's never going to be over anything. You know, it's always going to be over something stupid. Yeah. And I got because I a bit back at him, and he attacked me and practically broke my neck. Okay. Well, you know, it's just your husband's ready to explode. This is what this is what the problem is. Yeah. And his view of you was of a person who was going to defuse the bomb. That's what he expected you were going to do. Then you had twins, and all of a sudden he has no place to go. That he certainly doesn't sound like the type who would ever volunteer to go into um, uh, a program for stress reduction on the force, right? Uh, oh no. Never. In fact, we went we went to marriage counseling, and it had to be written that I was the only one going to counseling because, God forbid, he ever was investigated years down the line. That's right. That he'd gone to a you know, I've spoken to a lot of people in law enforcement who have shared exactly this problem, which is they are constantly being barraged with horrors on the street. Mm -hmm. They see the worst of the worst, and a part of them starts to die. They become angry. They are ready to blow up. They're waiting for a situation where they can vent their anger onto the world. And if they don't get help, they either develop ulcers or that sort of thing, psychosomatic illness or heart attacks, overeating or what. Or he's, he's, one thing that he's started doing is he's, I, I think he's bulimic. I mean, he's, that's what he's put in his, All right. his stress. All let's, right, let's talk about, <laughs> okay, let's talk about reality. Your world 
is in shambles. That's the first truth. The second truth is your husband is sick with stress and it's either going to kill him or kill you. Well, you know, I've, I've tried to tell him several times, you know, if this is the way you feel, if, if I have disrupted your life so much and the children have disrupted your life so much, I have no problem if we separate. Let's have a temporary separation. I don't think you need to ask him about that. I think you, d you say, look, you are so filled with stress and so angry and about to explode that you're not safe to be around. You're going to blow up with the kid over his glasses. You're blowing up with me and nearly breaking my neck over stupid things. I'm not safe with you. I'm asking you to move out and get help and not come back to you do because I have to protect these children because you are a present and real danger to yourself and this family. And unless you recognize that and get off your ego and stop trying to protect yourself from the uh, image that you are perfect and, and you're so afraid of admitting any kind of imperfection. Unless you're willing to put that aside, there's no hope for that and I'm blowing the whistle now. But you have to take control. Well, it's the a problem is though, you know, it's not, it hasn't just been him anymore. It's now filtered down to me. I understand. And I'm a danger to my kids but, now. But, I mean, but I once you get the source of your anger away from you, you will be in control and you won't be a source of, of a danger to your kids. You're calling me trying to get attention for the problem by saying you're a source of danger, you're going to kill your kids. The real thing you're calling for is that you are scared that he's going to kill you. Right? Yeah. Okay. That's where it is. And it is on that that you act. And once you act on that, you will be able to regain some power in your life. You absolutely need to see someone. And is there a, um, any, any resources in his uh, police department for, um, uh, for wives of, of, of uh, law enforcement officers? Um, I think I heard someone talking about it. I don't know in what capacity they... Well, then you have... Get him out of the house and tell him you have to get help because you're falling apart and you cannot stand here and let your family crumble. And if he wants you to, if he won't do anything, then he's telling you he would rather go down with his ego than be a loving father and husband. And you have to know that that's the decision he's going to make. Save yourself. It's the only possible route left to you. I hope you heard that. Dottie. Hi, I'm in the back, David. Um, you know, that call was so interesting because that woman called in about her anger for her children and, and you recognized that that was not her problem at all and changed it to what it really was. And I thought that was so interesting because she seemed so clear about why she was calling. Yeah, and the other thing, taking on all that punishing behavior, the, the extra courses and stuff, just to um, develop a sense of uh, her, her life having meaning and independence. The problem is when you have one of these abusive... Uh, egocentric macho men as a husband you become intimidated with them and as soon as you stop standing up to them you begin to lose your whole life and you have to make a stand at some place I hope I inspired that but she has to do it in a way to protect her children she'll do things for the kids that she won't do for herself I think a lot of women are facing that you know, we haven't talked to Shauna for a long time, and Shauna is on the line and wants to talk to you about her mother's birthday. Hi, Shauna. Hello. How are you? Fine. Can you hear me good? Yeah. You have to speak up because our phones aren't working. You heard, huh? Um, hold on. Okay. Shauna called in last time on my radio show. Oh, can you hear me now? I hear you, Shauna. All right. How does it feel to be nine years old? Not different? No. Oh. But first I want to um, wish you a happy New Year's because it's not Jewish. Um, happy New Year to you too. So, What's going on? Um, it's my dad called. Uh-huh. Uh, I think it was Wednesday. And um, he's living in his car. He, um... What did he, what did he, ha what did he have to say? What did your dad have to say? That he has a job as a plumber and that he lives in a car. That's all. Uh huh. Did he? What else did you talk about? That's all. We didn't talk about much. Me, because we don't talk anymore. Uh huh. It's hard to talk about anything. 
How did he sound? Did he sound happy? Did he sound better than he had been, or was it... He sounded grumpy. Grumpy? Yeah. H how could you tell? Well, not grumpy, grumpy, but he didn't sound, like, happy. He didn't sound sad. He just, he just sounded grumpy, kind of. Uh-huh. Is he still doing drugs? Um, I don't know. That did, I don't know. Did he sound clear? Huh? Yeah, he did. Okay. What else is going on? Um, it's going to be my mom's birthday on one day. She's coming tomorrow. She's coming over the house? Yeah, to see me. And I got her some presents. And um, she's living in an apartment with some guy named Mike. Uh-huh. Um, he drove mice. I, I don't know what he is, a carpenter or something. Well, that, but, sounds, that, that sounds a little more stable than things have been, huh? Yeah, but um, she, she sounds like she... You know how, like, when you're a regular housewife and you have... Get all everything she's like, I have to go clean the house. Stuff like that, so so like she's getting it together. Actually it's not an apartment, it's a house. She, so she's actually paying attention to things in the house? Yeah. How does that feel for you to hear her say that? Um, I like it, but I just wish she could get me and my brother back to the end. Okay. Now Shauna, I'm always telling you this, okay? And I don't want to put be a um a wet blanket, you know. I don't want to be someone to discourage you. But what you're doing is your mother's making some steps in the right direction. And she's been addicted for a long time, right? Yeah. So it means that you have to be patient. And don't get your hopes up too high. She'll move forward, she'll fall back. She'll move forward, she'll fall back. She's moving forward right now, and you're glad for her. But don't think that this is going to end all the problems. You know what I mean? You have a hard life, Shauna. Do you know wherever I go, people ask me about you? No. That's true. Today, as a matter of fact, today, three women asked about you. How is Shauna? What is... That's the truth. What does that make you feel like to hear me say that? People care about you, Shauna. And that means that when you get out into the world on your own, you're going to find that people are going to be able to relate to you probably a lot better than your own mom did. So if you're going to have expectations and hopes, the expectation and hope you should have is that you're going to be able to make your own life better and watch your mom, you know, at her birthday and, and realize that she's getting older and you're getting older and maybe the day will come when you'll have a better relationship but the most important thing that you have to work on is to have a life that you like for yourself. It's going to be your job to make your life happy. But I've got to tell you this too, Shauna. Listen. Yeah. No matter what, even if your mother and father were together, never got divorced, and your mother was never arrested for prostitution, and never did drugs, and was a terrific person, and always there for you, and never had a problem, and you never had to go live with your grandparents, even if all those good things happened, you'd still have to make a life for yourself. But it, my mom and my dad were never married. I know. But even if they were, you'd still have to make a life for yourself. So don't think of it as a punishment. It's a privilege to create your own life. And that's really what you have to look forward to. I have another thing to say. What's uh, that? Remember I told you about my sister, Sarah? Yeah. Um, I've heard from her dad and um, her brother. She, she talked, I don't know if it was two weeks ago or something like that. I talked to her on the phone. How old is she now? She's only three, but she didn't have much to say, but it was nice to hear her. Yeah, well, I think, Detroit, so. I, I think your fear about her is that she's a little bit slow. Well, no, no I just, I'm glad to hear her voice again. Uh-huh. Yeah, she is slow, but I'm glad to hear from her. Oh, um, that's good. I'm glad you're having more contact in your life. Yeah, I think that was, um, I don't know if I told you when I talked to you on the radio. Yeah. I had a, um, like, you remember I told you about Michelle? Yeah. And for leaving, well, I had this trainee. It was Natasha, and she left after that, too, so. That so, was right after when I talked to my daddy, John, that, my dad. Okay, so do you have a regular social worker now? Yeah. Do you like her? No, it's he. Do you like him? Yeah. Well, that's good. Maybe he'll stay in the picture a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah his name is Jack Levine. That sounds good to me. Okay, Shauna. Thank you for calling. You're welcome. I love you, and I'm sorry all the phones are getting messed up. Did it sound too terrible and confusing? Yeah, I got disconnected once. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs>
But you're back. You made it. Yeah. Thousands of people didn't, Shawna. You're a little lucky one. Thank you. I love you. Love you, too. You take Bye. care. Who's next, Dottie? She's terrific, huh? She's just amazing. I think that everybody roots for her. She's so special to us because she, every time she calls, she makes little steps forward, and we all get so excited for but, her. But can you imagine a life situation where you're constantly struggling to uh, find out what, whether your parents have the capacity to love at all, and you measure yourself as a child by the love you're given, and yet she can still be loving and re out, uh, reaching out to people? I think that's terrific. I can't imagine it. It's so... I can't imagine it. No. Go. Um, we have Tom on the line who found some pictures of himself that were taken when he was a child that really um, shocked him. Okay, Tom. Hello, Dave. Hi, Tom. How old are you, Tom? I am 29. You found some pictures? Well, what, what had happened about two years ago, I, it came back to me. The memory, I guess, was, had been repressed since I was six years old, and I remembered that I was sodomized by my father. My brothers and I were sodomized by my father. And then about a year ago, I, you know, dwelling on this, a lot more has come back to me, and I remember that pictures were taken, and that I actually was forced to take a picture of my father sodomizing my brother. And then about three months ago, I realized that I had seen these pictures, and that they were displayed on television um, it was back in Kansas City and there was a person a uh, mass murderer his name's Berdello and in a peripheral investigation they came up with these pictures and uh, why uh, well this this individual uh, he would take men and boys he would uh, kidnap them torture and sodomize them and photograph them. This is your father? No, this is another individual whom I now realize my father is linked to him. And, you know, it's, it's through occult activity. But um, these pictures were confiscated by the police in a peripheral investigation with that case. And about a week ago, I now remember that back in 1971, U.S. Customs agents came over and visited my mother and showed them a picture, showed her a picture of one of my uncles saying that, uh, that they had bought uh, kitty porn off of him. And then they showed the pictures to her. And, you know, she said, well, that looks like them, but I can't believe that it is. And, and you know, She's still married about, to your dad? Huh? She's still married to your father? No, they, they were divorced. It was right before prior to their divorce is when this occurred mm -hmm. and but there was other things that occurred before that that I've now remembered too and now I I can see that my father I'm you know I can I believe and I'm convinced that he is a member of the occult and probably still active in it and my family on that side are occultists and I believe it goes back generations where are you emotionally with all this uh, what's that? Where are you emotionally with all of this? Well, I'm I'm disturbed because, um, I w you know I I would like to expose these individuals, and I b I believe that I could, but I I'm getting resistance because I believe From that there is a cover up going on. Who's that, resisting this? Well, um, when I realized that these pictures were shown back in Kansas City, that I had seen them back in 1988. I, I called the uh, homicide detective who was investigating the case, who even wrote a book, and he's telling me he doesn't remember or know anything about these pictures. I talked to the TV station where I saw them, and they're telling me, you know, they're giving me a runaround. And I believe that there is an, a, a cover-up going on there because uh, it could point out people who are involved in the occult, and they, they kept suppressing that this individual, the Berdello, was, was not active in the occult at all, and I, I now I know that he was. What is your relationship to your father right now? Well, after he divorced my mother, um, I, he pretty much was out of the picture, and occasionally, occasionally he would call when I was over at my grandmother's, and... Um, when was the last time you saw him? 
Well, back I, I went back and visited him in 1987. Recent. And uh, what was that like? Was well, the memory hadn't returned yet. No, it had, I, it, it wasn't there. It hadn't been triggered yet. And well, you know, I felt out of place when I was there. And I even I, I was there on my birthday, and I even remember I started crying. I don't know why I was crying, but you know. Maybe um, you were scared. Yeah, I don't know. And. Uh, where were you when you started crying? Well, I was there uh, on his balcony, just, you know, it was like he was trying to explain to me about, you know, what had happened and everything. And, uh, what had happened when? Uh, with with the, why my father divorced my mother. And, and so here he was trying to explain what had happened, what, and yeah, a great sadness came over you because something else had happened that he wasn't talking about. Yeah. And that you, you had an awareness of, but didn't know what you were aware of itself. Scary position, horrible position, actually. Yeah, but but now, I'm, uh, you know, I feel kind of good in a way, because you know before, you know, I've I've realized that I've had problems with you know with with myself, um, you know, with just my behavior. You know, I'm kind of compulsive and depressed, and was isolated as a child and and have some self control problems. And I, I never could understand it, but now it's all in full view, and okay. I understand what has messed me up. All right. Now, the point is, in order to gain more mastery over the parts of your life, you have to resolve the loose ends of that feeling. Let's identify the feeling. The feeling was one of um, abuse and outrage, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that caused an, uh, uh, you were violated with great hurt. Yeah. And since that was internalized, the hurt turned into anger. The question is, what are you doing with all that anger? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you see, that when the anger isn't expressed, it's directed inwards. And in a directed anger does two things. One, it activates compulsive activity because you use your mind to deal with the anger with angry fantasies. And the, and the compulsion is nothing more than the antidote to the evil that you think you're going to do. You know, people who wonder whether or not the gas is off, they often have that uh, thought precipitated when they'd like to turn the gas on and gas everyone in the house, and now they're afraid they might wish it and it will happen, or they might wish the plane to crash. So they have to do all these things to undo the angry thought. You get what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. you're, you have a lot of angry thoughts, and your compulsions have to do with neutralizing the angry thoughts. Also, there's not enough power in these compulsive activities to neutralize them so that there's much anger that is being held in and the energy that it requires to hold in the anger lowers your self-esteem and depresses you. It's the depression is nothing more than a depression of energy because it's being used to hold the anger in rather than live. You've got to work this stuff through, pal. I mean, so Tom. how do you get the anger out? How, well, do you, how do you do that? Well, how do you get old anger out? The first thing you do is you get it out by dealing with the hurt. And you, by fully uh, possessing the memory. And, uh, to you know, there are a lot of things you can do to get anger out. I mean, you're angry at your father, right? Well, not only that, but I'm, I'm angry at other individuals, uh, you know, and, and angry that there's this, this movement, this occult movement, that there is a cover up there, and I, yeah, I would, I would really get a lot of anger out if, if I could expose it. Okay, if, One, I could. If, you could get, if you could find, you know, you can find out from people who work with cults, because that's what this is, um, if you, uh, to join forces and to see how you can support it and get involved in public awareness, that's a very positive use of that energy, but it's also important for you to get some of the hurt and anger out in a way that allows you to be free and find relief. That's called working through the old, old feelings. You know, sometimes you get overwhelmed with old feelings of anger and you don't know what to do with them. Um, there are some, all you want to do is externalize them in a safe way. Uh, let me give you a simple exercise, okay? You with me, Tom? Yeah. Get a piece of paper, write down your father's name on it, go into the bathroom, tear the paper up into a thousand pieces, throw it in the toilet, 
and then use the toilet and flush it. How does that feel? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know. I have. Uh, you had a laugh. Yeah. Because there was some release of tension. Do that a couple of times, just to get. This is what I think of you. This is what I think of the hurt. And you can do that with other people in your life who are obstacles. But the main thing is to start externalizing it. Of course, the best thing for you is to do some psychotherapy on this, because you really do need it. I mean, you're an abused child. You were. And you have to resolve it. And the way to deal with it is to find someone who's good with this sort of thing, and then to uh, channel the energy into a socially useful purpose where your awareness and your zeal and your wish for revenge can be turned into a social good to protect my children and the children of everyone else listening in. Yeah. Don't be discouraged. Yeah, I, well, it is kind of discouraging, you know. It, and, and there is a fear that I have that if I begin to reach for this, it, I, there will be people who will not like that and uh, will probably attempt to do me in. That's more your fear of your father than it is of these people. But I think what you can do is you can become involved, you can become a speaker, you can, you can get involved in, in these groups, how to be aware of the, of the occult. Instead of taking aim at anyone specifically, you can take aim at the problem and increase the awareness because in the end, it's our awareness of the danger that gets us, our minds ready for it and sets us up to make uh, the right case and to, um, to do what we have to do. And um, being a victim is never a more useful motivation than when it's turned to public good. Well, we're clearing up our problems, and hopefully we're clearing up some of yours. I want you to stay tuned, because we'll be right back after all of this. Yeah.